So this morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 6 in the New Testament, starting with verse 17. This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 6. And the last time the message was titled, More Fresh Filling. And I kind of look at sort of the last three sermons as um, sort of Jesus kind of coming to the earth and really refreshing what God had originally discussed in his word. You know, he kind of touches on fasting. He touches on the Sabbath. And they were so, the religious system sort of corrupted those ideas and those concepts to maybe you could say have more control over the people. Um, sometimes religion can sort of be a board game. You know, you, you get involved in a religion and you, you want to know what all the rules are to get into heaven. And if you do this, you can take a few steps back. And, you know, it's not, it's not something that God designed. He wanted it to be simple. So you kind of see Jesus bringing the purity of God's word back into the social system and even the religious system, and they resisted it, right? Today, the message is titled Blessings and Woes, right? Blessings, the beatitude, and woes. And we look at this teaching, and it's kind of neat because this is early in the Lord's ministry. I love to go through the historical content of everything because when I study God's word, it, it invigorates me because I really try to get a full understanding of what's going on. So it's early in the ministry, and you see these almost outdoor type, uh, classroom type scenarios where he's teaching the multitudes, but he's also teaching his followers. Remember what I talked about last time, disciples is really a pupil or a learner. So take the, the, the official titles aside and just look at the meaning of the word. And then some of them sort of, I guess you could say, move towards apostleship. And apostle means a sent one. So what we have is we have someone who starts out as a learner, learning the things of God. And then the Lord sends them out to affect everyone else. Pretty neat stuff. Um, you know, you go from the classroom to the field, right? And it's so important, actually, in 2022, as we go through, and, and these, especially, there's certain things in the Bible that a person who's even an atheist has heard of. Oh, the Beatitudes, oh, the Sermon on the Mount, right? And we can overanalyze, we can turn this into a college course, which is problematic because the main point that Jesus is trying to instruct us is, to sort of take our ideas about everything, life, love, generosity, getting to heaven, and saying, you know, it, humans have corrupted it over time. Let me bring you back to the purity of it. So we're going to look at this in four parts. And jumping in, just want to repeat a few verses from the last time because this is key. You know, the chapter delineations and verse delineations came later. This was all kind of read as one, one thought. Um, and sometimes we'll go to a different chapter and it really kind of cut off the foundation that was setting us up for that chapter. So verse 17, it says, And he, Jesus, came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Then he lifted his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So let's take this in bites. Uh, number one out of four parts is, is this the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain? So we're going to have a little fun with this, and then we're going to jump right into the whole meaning. And scholars... Yeah, you might say, oh, really? People like discuss that, you know? So Bible scholars do this. They, they have to go and find every nuance and sometimes argue, and it sort of misses the point. But let's, let's go down that rabbit hole for a minute. Is verse 17, it says, Jesus came down and stood on a level place. Matthew 5 said that Jesus went up the mountain. Matthew 5 is a much broader teaching than Luke 6, which is a more concise teaching. But both of these chapters have uh, divergence and they have similarities. So people do have discussions about it. Is this the Sermon on the, the Mountain? Some will say, no, it's a totally separate teaching. It's the Sermon on the Plain. Well, this is how it could be both. When you, whether he's going up the mountain or down the mountain, a lot of these very large mountainous regions had plateaus. So they would be a level place. So it could be the same thing. Could be a different place, right? 
Um, Luke, it was known for his concise teaching or just taking what Jesus did and give us the salient points. So it's quite possible that Luke uh, tells us of a different teaching, but it could quite possibly be that Matthew took the long route. It's not a big deal. You know, so you can see this being both. And Jesus also often repeated his teaching, so they would sink in. That's why God's word can be repetitive, because as humans, sometimes we need to hear something a few times before it sinks in. If you ask me what my opinion is, I don't really care. <laughs> so what I do care, so I'm not going to, you know, get into a tally and raise hands. Um, I care about what's the content and application because otherwise we miss the point. Continuing on, two out of four is the blessings or the beatitudes. And Jesus says, blessed are you poor for yours is the kingdom of God. So he's not telling everyone, and people do this, they'll take a line out of scripture and they'll make a whole doctrine out of it. They'll make a whole religion out of it. Jesus is not saying that we should take a vow of poverty. He's not saying that. He's also not saying that every single poor person gets into heaven because they're poor. But what he is saying is that the temporal restrictions on this earth because of power structure and greedy people, some will stay poor their whole lives, unfortunately, but that won't lack their spiritual opportunities to get to heaven. You have to imagine that a lot of poor people were, they may, maybe thought that the afterlife was the life they were currently experiencing and just dejected, just exhausted, just thinking, I probably can't even get into heaven. Look at my life. But what Jesus was saying is, regardless of where you're at here, God has given you an open door to heaven. As a matter of fact, you know, you might ask, and people do, how could anybody be blessed if they're poor? Who really wants to be poor? Nobody does. Well, they're not self-reliant and insulated like the uber-rich. Remember what Jesus said. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. See, the poor have to rely on others, and hopefully they make that transition to relying on God, and this is Jesus was trying to teach them. As a result, I believe many in Jesus' time, poor people, when they died, they were crowding into the kingdom. We couldn't see it, but he, he gives us a little bit about that later in, in the scripture. But my question to you is, regardless of your financial status, have you laid hold of the kingdom of God? Is everybody sitting here or watching on the live stream, do you know, do you have a relationship with Christ as your Savior? Is your self-reliance holding you back? You know, when I started going to a Bible-believing church when I was younger, I was very self-reliant because of a very chaotic and dysfunctional background that I came from as a boy. And I had to measure that with... God is trying to reach me. Am I allowing my self-reliance to keep me from having a relationship with him? So that's the problem where, you know, the person who's so insulated, they don't see their need for God a lot of times. And that can be very dangerous. Now, we can also make the application, and some do, that this means poverty is poverty of spirit or morally bankruptcy, morally bankrupt which we all are before Christ, but if we are, right, we can still get to heaven through Jesus, which is pretty awesome, you know, and, and we're going to make these applications as I go through this. We're going to look at bodily, we're going to look at emotionally, psychologically, but we're also going to look at spiritually, and it, Jesus could, could teach on many levels. Again, people will argue about that. It means this, no, it means this. Both of those things apply. Both of those things that I just said apply. Um, you know, we have to, it's such a cliche, don't put God in a box. You know, God's teachings were so powerful, they reached people on multiple levels. And they can reach us on multiple levels. But, right, body, mind, spirit, with the spirit being most important, because that's what determines where we spend eternity. Now, I'll just say this as well. Let's just think about this, and I like to throw these things out there, is that all the people on the earth right? And there could have been millions. Um, many of them heard the stories of Jesus. May, many of them saw them directly. Many of them were affected by the, the apostles and the disciples that went out. So all the people on the earth when Jesus was teaching, 2,000 years later, they're all dead. They all stepped into eternity. Where are they? 110, 120 years from 2022. Everybody who's alive today on this earth stepped into eternity. Where's everybody going? That's a powerful thought when you think about it. Because we have been programmed, God has designed us so that what we see 
is mostly the physical realm. We don't see the souls that pass and they go up to be with God or they go to face judgment. We don't see that. So these are very powerful images and metaphors and symbolisms that Jesus uses. He says, yours is the kingdom of God. Now, for a poor person living back then, both the political system and the religious system almost had this weird relationship where they kept the oppressed oppressed. Okay, so for Jesus to liberate them and say, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Come through me, right? No one gets to the Father except through me. He gave the poor people something that no one else ever gave them. Many of these people could only have a life uh, if they were fortunate of begging and people out of, you know, compassion giving them money. So this is very, very powerful stuff. Yours is the kingdom of God. Again, poverty is not a prerequisite to get to heaven, but trusting in Christ is. What did Jesus do on the cross? He died for our sins. And the people, through Jesus, were able to bypass the religious and the political board games that, that held them down. That's why the gospel is so refreshing, if it's preached properly. Verse 21, he says, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled, or you'll be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. So hungry in a physical sense, Jesus did amazing miracles. He did feed people to the point where they had baskets full of leftovers. Now, in my house, I'm the leftover eater. My wife can vouch for that. I don't like anything to go to waste. But Jesus did such an incredible miracle that there were so many leftovers that people could have been fed. It, just, it could have just kept happening, right? The miracle in the Old Testament of the, of the, uh, the oil that never abated. You know, the widow just kept getting more oil. It was, it was an incredible blessing. However, in a spiritual sense, look at the, let's look at this. Has this life left you hungry? You're watching for the first time. Has this life, 2022, has this life left you hungry? Do you have a void in your life where you might not even know what you're seeking? And that was me as a young man coming to a Bible-believing church. The sermons were touching my soul, and I couldn't articulate and even subconsciously, I couldn't articulate what it was doing to me, but it was starting to change me. There were longings that I had from my past that were starting to be filled by God. He was the only one who could do it. Christ wants to fill our innate longings for him that we might not even know that we have. Have you noticed that this world is vacuous? You know, go home and if you want to be depressed read the news, you know what I'm saying? Watch the news. Now, I actually suggest you do out something outside in the sun, in the fresh air, but um, all you have to do is see the world's situation, including in our country, and you see the world's vacuous. This world cannot satisfy. And if we're truly followers of Christ, we have traded the hunger for this world for the filling of the Lord, because that is the only thing that can satisfy, right? I'll go over this again. He says, Blessed are you who weep now, who cry, for you shall laugh. Weeping, we look at this as psychological, we look at this as emotional. There are times that we get injured and we, we weep because we're experiencing pain. But um, this is more of a response to trauma or tragedy. But knowing God in a relational way gives us emotional stability that we might not normally have. You know, even as a young man in college, uh, before Christ, I pondered the things of God. You know, the more I was taught biology and anatomy and chemistry and the life sciences, um, I still was left without answers. But coming to Christ, you know, uh, the, the pondering and the difficulty, I started to now put things in places and I started to understand even the meaning of life. You know, and we look at the spiritually, not, maybe not just physically tears going down your cheeks, but spiritually some quietly weep or ponder the sin in their life and could, if they could ever get into heaven. However, Christ pro provides the answers for that. I can tell you I've done about 50 funerals and there always inevitably are people that are listening that look terrified because they're not in their job, they're not you know, on vacation, they're in a place where somebody that they love passed. And they're forced to come with the reality that people die. So, so some do ponder, you know, and again, as a young man, I did, I pondered, what's going to happen when I die? Like, I didn't know any of these things. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was troubling. 
however God wanted me to, to change, right? To, to have a different outlook on life. And I'll just say this as well. A point of interest is both crying and laughing are both what's called cathartic. They're, they're, you can purge yourself of negative things that build up. You ever have a good cry and then you laugh afterwards? You know, It just felt good to get that off your chest. Or you're in a bad mood, you're depressed, and your people that care about you get you to laugh. And you don't even want to laugh at first, but you can't help yourself because they're making you laugh. And then you just feel better afterwards. So there, it's called catharsis. It's called cathartic. It's, but unfortunately for this weeping, you know, this is... This is a more, this isn't really cathartic. This is a, a, an experience to trauma or um, maybe again that spiritual pondering. However, laughing in the kingdom is paired with joy. Right? When we arrive there, you know, I always carry my wallet, my cell phone, my keys, wherever I go. I don't even leave the house to go to the store without that. You know, um, do I look presentable? When I get to heaven, I'm not going to have my wallet, my keys. I don't really, I'm not going to care how I look, you know what I'm saying? It's just going to be great. Uh, there's just not a care in the world. When you're in God's presence, anything that maybe we might have thought of, he might be like, listen, I, I got that under control. Just enjoy. Welcome. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I have to say that at the end of the last church service, I, I had to go do a wedding and I was running around and just my staff and I, most people left. We were just, just kidding, busting, just kidding around about things and just laughing about stupid things. But it was fun, you know what I'm saying? So I, I say that I've never laughed so much than when I became a Christian. I lightened up. And my wife t tells me, she goes, I remember when we were dating, you were so serious. <laughs> so just everything, just, I, maybe I think too much, it's probably, but... I have to say that, um, James, this is what happens when you sit in the front pew. You were very serious, too. I know you for a long time. You were so serious. And then you became a Christian. He's like the church comedian now. It's like he makes everybody laugh, but he's a different person. It's, bro, it's good. <laughs> it's a good thing. So, you too. <laughs> so, it's the people sitting in the front. Um, but it's, see, we're laughing now. Oh, you should laugh in church. You should, you should be light. You go out into this world, everything's expensive, people are, there's just weird stuff. Like down the street, a, a mile from my house, there was like a fist fight in the street. A bunch of people were duking it out. Um, I didn't see it, somebody told me about it, and then it was in the paper, because somebody brought a machete out. Oh yeah, people are losing their minds. They're fighting in the stores. It's like, folks, our job is to bring the joy of God to others. You know, and, and I smirk sometimes. My wife and I will go out, I'll try to engage somebody for the Lord, and they totally shut me down. And I just look at her, and I, I'm like, no, it didn't work that time. You know what I'm saying? But it's, it's, it's actually not funny if they don't know the Lord. But I just, how many times, babe, do I say, I, I don't care? And I don't. Like, oh, this could happen, that could happen. I'm like, I don't care. The Lord's got it under control. That wasn't me, B.C., before Christ. So, listen, God promises us everything on the other side, but there are some benefits here as well, because Jesus said he'll give us an abundant life. James, I still want you to sit in the front. I love you, bro. <laughs> so, verse 22, <laughs> I, verse 22, it says, blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you. You ever been excluded because you're a believer? Come on, <laughs> you know you have social groups, um, and again, I don't get offended, but I, I just have a sense that everyone else is invited but us, because we might say Jesus or something like that. Um, but this is worse. They revile you. They cast out your name as evil. They try to ruin your reputation. For the Son of Man's sake, rejoice. What? The Bible says some things that on first glance are bizarre. Rejoice? This is terrible. They're ruining my reputation. They're lying about me. They gossip about me. He says, rejoice in that day and leave for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. So 22 through 23, the coming persecution. Now, to be clear, we're not going to be hated because we did something deserving of it. We see that in 1 Peter 2. And, you know, I have to say this. There, 
there are some in the church that are, they can be obnoxious and they can turn people off, right? And they get treated a certain way because of their behavior. Jesus isn't talking about that. He's talking about when you're doing it right, when you're loving people, when you're ministering to them, and you're hated because of that. All you have to do is look at, in the last few years, uh, church vandalism on the rise, personal attacks, picketings, some church shootings. Why? Because the world wants to do all types of evil, and the people of God, oh, them again. (sighs) Those Christians. We say pump the brakes. We say, no, that's wrong. You look at communist, fascist, or bad theocracies around the world, Christians are imprisoned and murdered just because they're Christians. And their laws and their courts allow it. It's insanity, but it's happening as we speak. Jesus says, rejoice and leap for joy because your reward is in heaven. What a reception those martyrs will receive when they step into eternity. Something we just here can't fathom. In John 15, Jesus said, they'll hate you because they hated me first. You carry my name, you carry my message. Right? Jesus was crucified. John the Baptist was, was murdered. Uh, many of the, the good prophets of God were killed. They met awful deaths, imprisonment, starvation, all these types of things. Because the world wants to do what the world wants to do. It's a fallen world. You know, we have often been, as Christians, in the minority against the evils of Rome, right? You read Christian history. First century believers, you know, they knew, oh boy, this is going to get us trouble, but they were doing the right thing. Uh, Or the evils of slavery in the United States, and even slavery today that exists in some countries. It's a a terrible thing. Um, But I think what's a little disturbing is Christians used to be, we knew that we were going to get persecuted, right? Whether it was Mao's China or Stalin's Russia or Hitler's Germany or the Castro brothers Cuba, they first, this is a fact, I did a lot of study on the 20th century, they went into the religious organizations and said, this is what we're doing. You either follow us or you can't operate anymore. And that started persecution in those areas. So there sort of was a church, and some of you are from, remotely from some of these areas. Um, there was, even in China today, they have these churches but they're window dressing. The pastors are told what to preach, the priests, right? And if you don't, they take away your status. There goes your congregation. So you're caught between preaching the truth or preaching the communist truth or the Nazi truth, which is not the truth at all. And Christians have been persecuted, right? I I followed a lot of Christians in the Nazi era and then the communist era, uh, and they, they had a really hard life because they, w- they refuse to bow to these organizations. But I see a trend today, and I think it's cause of, a lot because of social media and big tech where Christians are afraid to speak the truth. Or Christians will go with any wind of doctrine, any sociological Marxist group or organization that uh, has it at its tenets things that are against their own faith. And ironically, in 2022, there are those overseas believers who are fighting these evils But some Christians today, because they don't want to be persecuted or even just ostracized on social media, they're going with some... you got to really vet these movements before you you jump on, climb on board with them. However, Jesus told us that if you suffer persecution, you're in good company. Because you're in good company, he says, with God's prophets, but also with Christ himself. And that comes from John 15. Verse 24, he says, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. So three is the woes. Well, we went through the blessings, the beatitudes, now we're at three out of four is the woes. Woe was translated in exclamation of grief. So this is important because the Bible doesn't stereotype, you know, or put people in what I would call a monolithic group. Just because you're wealthy doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. And that's a, today, the eat the rich political kind of thing, that is not, has nothing to do with what Jesus was teaching. There were actually, if you read the Bible there, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was the wealthy who were righteous, realized that God couldn't save, or excuse me, that riches couldn't save them, and they turned to God, and God saved. 
and then they use their wealth generously to further the kingdom of God. Uh, but Jesus is speaking, these people that he's speaking about, because we're going to go through A, B, and C here, they are full to excess, right? They have no sense of need, and because of that, they have no need for God. You ever see somebody who's uh, super uber rich power brokers, and they, they say that they're atheists, but they talk bad about God. Wait a minute, if he doesn't exist, how are you talking about him? You know, it's like they're annoyed because if they were to actually believe in God, then he, they wouldn't be on the top anymore. They would have to submit to God. And it's, some of it's psychological. But you look at this sort of billionaire oligarchical class in the U.S. and Europe where they play God. Now, I'm going to go into that a little bit, some of these groups, right? Jesus said to them, you have received your consolation. The ultimate consolation is heaven, is the kingdom. However, some have traded any semblance of the afterlife for the enjoyments and pleasures of this world. So you have to look at the, the full picture here. Um, and it's just the way it is. They worship this world. They worship themselves, right? 25, he says, woe to you who are full for you shall hunger. It doesn't mean somebody just ate a big meal and they're full, and Jesus is saying, you're going to be hungry. This is somebody who's completely satisfied. Again, they have no room for God or the afterlife. You shall hunger. What would life be like in a godless eternity? Because even though those power brokers that many of us know, certain names come into mind, they enjoy the summertime, the pleasures of a, a warm day with a nice breeze. They enjoy the ocean and the sound of the ocean. They enjoy food that comes out of the ground. All their needs are met. Those people who are atheists, and I love atheists, I pray for them, I want them to change and see the truth of God. They're enjoying a world, it's a fallen world, that God is that God created perfect, but we have ruined due to sin, they're okay with that though, because they have the best out of this world. One day, they will be, if they don't repent, they'll be thrown into an afterlife there where all the things I just mentioned are not there for eternity. So what does a godless eternity look like? The atheist and the agnostic and the God-hater are all enjoying God's creation right now. And that's sad if they don't repent. So I say these things because I like to go out and I like to change people's minds because I don't want them to go through that. No matter who they are, Jesus said, praise for your enemies. You know, it's, it's sometimes we, we have to think about these things. So the, the fully, the rich to, the, to an excess, no need of anything, B here is this, sol, this fullness. Um, and then we're going to get into 25B. It's where he says, woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. You have to find the connections here, the contiguity. It doesn't mean if you're a jokester and it's clean, that God doesn't like you, right? That's not what we're talking about here. This sort of laughter is laughter from a, a haughty perspective, you know, and the sort of like, you can't touch me mentality. I'm fully insulated. You know, again, I think of powerful people who, and I've seen it on TV, they, they do very well. But when you have the discussion about poor people and, you know, the lack of baby formula and the price of food going up and people can't afford to take a trip, they, they just kind of, <laughs> you ever see that? I've seen that in interviews by people in power. Wow, have a little compassion. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm, I would say I'm middle class. But I'm concerned for the, it's why we do the ministries we do, the food for the soul, the outreaches, whatever they need. If we're lacking something downstairs and we're going to give them a full diet, let's purchase it. Who, I just was talking to, probably both of you, <laughs> but I'm like, just, just buy it. Whatever it takes. We don't have to wait for the food bank to open up. Give these people what they need. Now, I, I'm not feeling, I'm feeling the pinch. It's expensive for me too, but I'm not feeling the pinch like an abjectively poor person. So I still have compassion for those people and I still want to help them. So this laughter is, God, God, Jesus 
you know, he wanted us to have an abundant life. It's not because you're enjoying life. This, is, this comes from more of the other two. C, so it's, it's the, the rich, the full, and the, the haughty. Let me just, I don't know how deep I want to go with this, but how many of you are familiar with the World Economic Forum? Not a lot. You know, we're going to enjoy our summer. Things are going on in this country where we're being forced into a, an aggressive globalist system that the Bible speaks about, which will be the foundation and the platform for the Antichrist, who is a young, charismatic, aggressive globalist. There are things that are happening in this world, Davos, uh, Switzerland. Look it up for yourself, World Economic Forum, global monetiz monetization, right? One world currency, we're really headed there. It gets even worse. I'm probably gonna get <laughs> my tech guy up there. He says, one of these days, you're gonna, you're gonna get scrubbed from the <laughs> big tech's platform because I name names and I don't care. And then maybe everybody will have to come back to church to hear me. Um, but the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, he is a, an awful person. He's one of those oligarchical billionaires who has bought some of our politician, and we're making policy now based on some of this power. Let me just read to you word for word. I just, if I first saw the video and I said, that can't be true, I vetted it, I saw the video again. So he has a, a buddy, Dr. Yuval Noah Harari, who said, quote, Humans are now hackable animals. And I thought, okay, maybe it's in the name of science. We're going to cure cancer, so we're going to hack the genetic information. I'm just trying to, I just give people the benefit of the doubt. He says, there, humans are no longer subject to the intelligent design of literally some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design. If it wasn't so creepy, it's... It's scary because these people have a lot of power. They make policy in a lot of Europe and they're trying to drag us along. That's why you see the chaos we see. He said, he said this, doctors in the fascist regimes, which I believe he was speaking about the Nazis, Joseph Mengele and the communists, tried to figure this out with medical experiments, but now we have the technology well, you're going to compare what you're doing to these psychos in the 20th century, kind of reviving them? He goes on, look it up for yourself. I'll give you the information if you want to see it. He said, the idea of humans having free will is over. Today we have the technology to hack human beings on a massive scale. You know, this is what's going on in the world. So when people think it's funny or they laugh about the Antichrist and the consolidation of the European countries, including us being dragged along with this. We're already being pushed into these global treaties where the treaties supersede our sovereignty. You know, hopefully some brave people in the courts will say, no, you can't do that. They can't determine in Switzerland what we do in our country. We're a sovereign nation. We'll see. Pray about it. And when the elections come, vet your candidates. Listen to what they're saying. You know, I, I'll just say this, not political, because I think that there are people in both parties, so I'll put a lot of you at ease, Republican and Democrat, who have been bought by these powerful entities. And you may ask why. Well, because their kids are taken care of, they're promised jobs, lucrative jobs when they retire from public office. There's a lot of reasons. Offshore accounts. When you pull Christ out of a society, the morality drops, and it, the attitude is, I'm just out for myself. I don't care about these Americans. You know, I'm, I'm the elite class. I deserve these things. We need to be paying attention. So these, these woes, right, pretty, pretty sad stuff. They are playing God. They want to be God. They want to shudder our free will. They want to hybridize us. Look up transhumanism, where they take human beings and they... They want to, again, hack our genetic code, also to add computer programs into the body to be able to control us more. It's right here in the scripture. It's been saying it for so many years. Verse 26, he says, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. 
speak well of you. Is that where we're at today? Big tech profile, social media, put your best foot forward. Phony, phony profiles and fake lives are plastic culture, right? Pretend to the world that you are somebody that you're really not in real life. I got to tell you this, in Isaiah 30, the prophets of God wanted to tell the truth to the culture. And the people's response out of Isaiah 30 was, they said to the prophets, prophesy smooth things to us. They didn't want the prophets of God to tell them the truth because they were offended by the truth. Oh, our, our nation has gone away from God and he's not particularly thrilled and we're going to lose some of our protections. We don't want to hear that. They would elevate the prophets, the false prophets, who would just tell them good things all the time. And today, people would rather you tell them a lie if it makes them feel good than tell them the truth if it triggers them. Four out of four. Additional points, additional points from Matthew 5. I'm going to tie this up. It says, those who mourn will be comforted. Right? How many people are struggling in this life? Turn to Christ. You will be comforted. And you will have that side benefit of your outlook changes, and you'll be comforted here as well. I truly believe that. The meek or the humble shall inherit the earth, not the proud and the arrogant. The merciful shall be shown mercy. Well, that's important. How do we treat people? Do we treat others the way we want to be treated? Do we show others mercy? Or is it just, I'm right, my way? Right? And it doesn't matter who it is. The peacemakers will be called the children of God. The peacemakers. When you're with your social group, are you, you have, we have to ask ourselves, am I the person who stirs the pot when two friends are going at it, or am I the type of person that says, you know what, I'm really going to stick my neck out here, but I'd like to help you guys kind of reconcile this. And that can be, that can be <laughs> punishable at times because you, now you're in, in the mix. But are we peacemakers or are we pot stirrers? Brings me to my last point. The blessing, let's go back to what this original, let's go back 2,000 years. The blessing and woes were the opposite of what the disciples got to see play out in the world. Now listen, you grow up, you grew up in a culture, right? You grow up in America, you grow up in Europe, you grow up in China, you grow up in whatever. When you become an adult, a lot of your your outlook and the way you deal with things is shaped by your worldview based on how you grew up. It's, it's, it's very good to actually leave sometimes the United States and just go to other countries and see it's a different world out there, right? People think differently, people do things differently. When we read the Bible, we can be so brainwashed by even our culture and that we, we, it's a learning curve to understand the things of God. So back then, a blessing, and this is why Jesus said, blessed, and the disciples are scratching their head probably thinking, I thought that was a good thing, Peter. You know, woe to you. Oh, I thought that was a good thing. So back then, blessing, if you were healthy, wealthy, it sounds like some teachings today, healthy, wealthy, and had a good reputation in the world, they looked at that as being blessed by God. There's a reason for all this. However, the woes of the way the people looked at things back then were those who couldn't achieve. So what they would, what we, I, it's a horrible word, but people use it in our culture, the losers of society. Oh, they can't achieve. They must deserve it. And they went as far as to believe that if they were poor and they couldn't make it, that it was God punishing them. Talk about blaming the victim and adding insult to injury. So you see a lot of Jesus' teachings turned a lot of these things it was the opposite of what the people thought because now God the Son is coming down and saying, oh, look at this from God's perspective, not your personal experiences. Today it's similar, right? We have cliches, make it to the top, be insulated no matter what. Another one, you can have a phony persona as long as people speak well of you and you get what you want. Lying is okay if it makes others feel better about themselves and about you. Look out for number one, because nobody else is going to. You should keep your faith hidden. It could offend somebody. Don't show off your flaws or weaknesses. You'll never get promoted here. 
But God looks out for the downtrodden and he will reward them. He opposes the arrogant, the haughty, the selfish, and all the scores will be settled in the kingdom. And he's warning everybody, start practicing that now so you're not shocked when you stand in God's presence. In the end, character, attitude, faith, self-awareness, love, honesty, obedience to God, and humility are far more important as we go through these than circumstances, wealth, being insulated, social status, societal status, proper social groups. The disciples needed to unlearn the world's ways, and folks, we need to do the same thing. And in these next few weeks and possibly months, as we go through this sermon, again, it, we're not to sit back and, and be observers and, and start to postulate, well, did Jesus mean this and Jesus mean that? If we're not actually applying it to our lives, we're totally missing the point. And this summer, what's, what's important? Is it important to apply God's word to our lives and make a difference for the kingdom or just do what everybody else is doing in America in June and July and August? So these are the things that really matter, something we should take to heart, and it also carries into eternity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, your word is, is power, Lord. It's, it's, it's amazing. It, it's like sometimes getting splashed with cold water in the face. It changes the channel. Uh, but I, we know you do it because you love us. You want us to know the truth. You want us not to walk around as your disciples in deception, to be self-deceived. Um, but it, it is, I would say this, that it's hard to, almost impossible to follow any of these things unless we are a follower of Christ. So I just would ask anyone now, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and it's something that you desire, that you would come up out of your seat, come to the front and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Again, it's just something that you, you know, every Sunday I do it a little differently because it isn't about a formula. It's about the heart behind the words. So maybe somebody will come up with you, come forward, lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus and uh, enjoy him in this life and the next. You come if that's your desire. Is there anyone who'd like to come forward to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior? If you're wrestling with it, it's something you should really consider because part of you is saying yes, part of you is saying no. It's part of that trichotomous nature that God is tugging, but he's not, he, God's a gentleman. He's not going to grab you by the scruff of the neck. He's going to gently, you know, call you, um, but you can still use your free will to stay there. I can tell you that at any given Sunday between altar calls, uh, I have gotten phone calls or inboxes of people who had more questions. I don't mind staying here after service. 
if there's something you're struggling with but you're just not going to make it up here, talk to me after service. But I do want to, I do want to challenge us is that people, people look at the Sermon on the Mount or Jesus' teachings, they almost romanticize it without actually applying it to their lives, and that's dangerous. We're going to see that how many times do we go through the Gospels and the disciples, if you could, almost like had question marks over their head, what is he saying? But we were taught this, and it was tough for them. But in order for them to be a part of this organization to change the world, they had to get out of their, their ways and understand God's ways. So I, I believe we're going to be challenged too. And you know what I say to people when they romanticize the Sermon on the Mount? I'm like, really, really read it for yourself. And then tell me that it's not difficult to do. And if you don't know the Lord... It's impossible to do unless you're in Christ. I think what Jesus did was he showed us these teachings and we we're like, wow, this is hard. But it, it brought us to the place of a realization that I need a savior. Isn't that amazing? Just by even forgiveness and love and I mean, generosity, who does these things? You really have to be filled with the spirit in order to do it with joy and not worry about retribution or if you're going to get payback or if you're going to be vulnerable. So I just want to, I want to encourage everyone here that this is going to be fun, but it's also going to be challenging. Um, so, th so that's all I want to say, believe it or not. Uh, at this time, let's all stand for worship.